the aquariums of Pyongyang, 10 years in the North Korean Gulag by Kang Cho Hwan and Pierre Rigolat. This book gives the reader a rare insight into the North Korean slave camps and reveals the harsh conditions that people endure under the dictatorship of Kim Jong-un. When Kang, the author, was nine years old, he, his father, his grandmother, and sister were accused of crimes against the government because Kang's grandfather criticized the regime. They were sent to a concentration camp called Yodok, and it's formally called Work Group Number 10. This camp was for redeemables, with the stated purpose of redeeming them through work and study. His mother wasn't allowed to come with them, even though she pleaded to go. Her reason was something political, but um, she still wanted to be there with them, to suffer with them but she wasn't allowed to. On the way to the camp, the prisoners were kept in the back of a truck. They didn't have any windows, so once they arrived at the camp, it was a bit of a culture shock to them because they saw people dressed in rags, their hair was overgrown, and these people were very filthy as well. Kang and his family were designated a hut. Kang said the hut had a roof of bare wooden plants with dried earth for walls and dirt for a floor. Power outages were frequent. The water froze in the winter and there were no faucets. Water actually had to be drawn from the river, which was a 10 minute walk to and from. They had to forage for wood in order to heat their hut as well. And their wood-burning furnace with a cauldron also served as a stove. The camp was a trough of a valley and it was surrounded by high mountains with armed guards and they were on every mountaintop. Besides the barbed wire and the military patrol, there were traps set for animals. And if a human were to try to escape, well, that person could be caught up in one of these traps. And so uh, you didn't want to do that. And plus, if you got caught, well, that meant execution. Snitches were also uh, a problem at the camp. Um, Kang said that he learned later that in the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, snitches were prevalent there too because the guards couldn't really manage all of the prisoners and do all the surveillance themselves, so they uh, appointed people to do this for them. And they carried on the responsibility, and then um, they would go to whoever it was that assigned them this job and tell them, you know, what was going on at the camp. Uh, the uniforms the prisoners wore resembled Chinese prison outfits. The wardrobe consisted solely of a purple jacket and a pair of pants and fitted with a great deal of buttons. The clothes shrank as soon as they got wet and since the clothes were meant to last the whole year, and they would tear and they would have to be repaired quite often. So Kang would do everything he could to get clothes or repair the ones that he had. And when he was on funeral duty, he would steal clothes from the corpses and use those. Kang's first day of school at Yodok was a degrading experience. Teachers addressed students uh, in the harshest, crudest manner possible. Instead of calling them by their first or last names, teachers called them son or daughter of a whore. Teachers also beat their students as well. One of the most common forms of school punishment was latrin duty. Uh, a latrine is a communal bathroom 
with several toilets that are dug in the ground and held in a septic tank. A student who was tardy would have to do a week's worth of latrine duty, which consisted of cleaning the stalls or emptying the septic tanks. Over the course of his time at Yodok, uh, Kang had a dozen male teachers and two female teachers. Obviously, the female teachers were a little bit nicer. Uh, the two worst teachers he had were the wild boar and the old fox. The wild boar was the worst. And um, one time the wild boar was beating a student and the boy fell into the septic tank and was trapped for a very long time. Eventually the boy escaped, but no one helped him clean up or bandaged his wounds. The kid died a few days later. What a terrible death that would be, you know? Uh, the wild boar felt that since the kids and parents were counter-revolutionaries, they all deserved to die. As for the old fox, his favorite punishment was having students stand naked in the courtyard uh, all day long with their hands behind their backs. You know, what a shameful punishment that was. The kids worked in groups of five. If illness or physical incapacity caused one of the detainees to lag, the whole group fell behind and risked being penalized. There was no such thing as individual responsibility. One's work only counted as part of a collective output. As long as a team's quota hadn't been reached, none of its members could return to the village no matter how old or tired or sick they might be. In spite of having to eat rats and other rodents, in spite of the freezing cold temperatures and the dirt and the filth, there were two events that gave the camp a morale boost, uh, heavy rains and the launching of new education programs. Heavy rains made it impossible to work outside, and new education programs gave them something to do other than being slaves outdoors. And so it gave prisoners a little time to rest and possibly to heal. Despite these respites, more than 100 people died in Kang's village per year. Newly arriving prisoners were the first to die. The most important thing was fighting malnutrition. Most of the camp's diseases weren't even that serious, but in their weakened state, a simple cold could kill. Kang almost died during his first few months in the camp from serious bouts of diarrhea. The sweat box was one of the harshest punishments imaginable. It was located near the main entrance of the camp. It was devoid of any opening and in total darkness. Prisoners were deprived of food. They had to crouch down on their knees with their hands on their thighs and unable to move. Though suicide was forbidden, many took their lives. Since suicide was viewed as an escape attempt, if the suicide was unsuccessful, the person would be executed. So the best case scenario would be for somebody to be successful in their suicide. In the spring of 1981, Kang was assigned to bury bodies of people who perished during the winter. This allowed him to strip corpses and reuse or barter their clothes. But one of the grossest things about this was Kang found out that the corn was being grown over the corpses that he and other people buried. So imagine this. The corn is fertilized by dead bodies beneath it. I mean, they would find hands and arms and other pieces of people in the field. That, that's just, I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine that. So the horrors of the camp really have no end. There wasn't only disease like malnutrition and mental torture, but there were also public executions. And one in particular that Kang talked about was a prisoner he saw um, 
get executed, and this prisoner had tried to escape. Kang said this. He said, he walked to his death without being a member of the family of man. He could have been mistaken for an animal with his wild hair, his bruises, his crusts of dried blood, and bulging eyes. His mouth was stuffed full of rocks, so people couldn't hear him talk or scream. So he couldn't say anything because his mouth was full of these rocks, you know? And apparently he couldn't spit them out. Sexual relations were forbidden at the camp. If caught, uh, men were sent to a sweat box and women were subjected to public humiliation, or worse. Uh, a former camp guard who escaped to South Korea talked about these uh, barbarous punishments that were inflicted on women who were found guilty of sexual relations. Uh, one was a pregnant woman who was bound to a tree and flogged. Another was a woman who uh, had her breast cut off. And another woman was raped with a spade handle. I mean, these are brutal punishments. Finally, in February 1987, Kang and his family were released even though they were released, they weren't exactly free because North Korea is like one giant gulag anyway. So Kang eventually made his way to China and then to South Korea, which is where he lives now, I think, unless he moved. But um, So he continues to fight against the humanitarian crisis that's going on in North Korea. I think this book is worth reading because... Um, it tells you what happens when communism uh, reaches its full potential. This is the end result of communism. I mean, complete totalitarianism. And uh, it's happening in the USA. It's happening all over. I mean, not to this extreme. But this is where communism leads to, though. You see? So you don't want to get to that point. Anyway... Talk to you later. Bye.